Good morning, my friend. Um, today, we've been talking lately um, about self-brain surgery, about the basics of this idea of how to take your brain and control how your thinking works in an attempt to control how your life plays out. So this is basically changing your brain chemistry, learning how to look at what you think about in a new way and improve and maximize your thought hygiene so that you can be infinitely happier, right? That's the whole idea of this uh, most recent series. And last week, of course, um, I introduced you to my friend Kristen Smedley, who taught us about resilience, and we've had some good conversations. We've got a couple more interviews uh, coming up soon that will be beneficial to you. But today, I want to talk about flying. I grew up around airplanes. Both of my parents were private pilots. My mom and my dad both had their private pilot's license and took me flying a lot as a kid, and I really always enjoyed that. And we lived just down the dirt road from a pilot who flew in World War II, a guy named Glenn Walters. Um, I used to walk down to Glenn and Betsy Walters' house. We called them Brother Walters and Sister Walters because they went to church with us. And um, Back in those days, it was common to refer to people as brother and sister. Um, which is probably why I still call my friend's brother all the time. Um, Anyway, I would walk down there to their house, and Betsy would make gingerbread and show me old pictures and tell me stories about her life. She was a fascinating lady. And Brother Walters would take me uh, fishing in his pond and let me mess around on their place. But the most important and fun thing that I got to do when I went to visit the Walters is that Glenn had a shop in his backyard. And in the shop was the frame of an airplane that he was building. And thinking back on it, he seemed to be building that plane the whole time I was growing up, and I don't really think he ever finished it. Um, but he had the plane there, and he would let me play around on it. I would sit in the cockpit and play with the controls, and because he didn't have the skin on the plane, I could see what happened when you pulled up on the elevator, you know, when you turn the, the when you pushed on the rudder pedals when you played around with the control stick i could see how that affected the control surfaces of the airplane and he taught me a lot about that and he would take me flying and he took me out to the airport and and i just spent a lot of time with him and learned a lot from him and i spent countless hours as an eight or nine year old kid in that shop playing around on that airplane and I, in my mind i would you know be flying missions in world war ii like pappy boyington or i'd be saving the day and you know rescuing the the people who needed saving, and I just I grew up imagining this idea of being a pilot, and I never got to do it, but I always had this idea. And then when I was in the Air Force, I really loved fighter pilots. I loved hearing their stories and getting to know them, and I just I just love flying. So, in fact, when I was a, a resident, I was around a lot of professional athletes because my my mentor, my professor, Doctor Maroon, was the uh, team doctor for the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Pittsburgh Pirates. And so there were always professional athletes around, and we got to know a lot of them. And to me, it was just another guy, just another person, you know, some famous NFL player. But when I was in the Air Force and I got to meet an F-16 pilot or an F-15 pilot, I was like a little kid, uh, almost one of their autograph. <laughs> Not quite that much, but I just I love flying. And the reason I love flying, I think, the most is goes back to those days with my mom and my dad and Glenn Walters and, and playing around on that airplane, and it just was always part of my culture. But also, when you're flying, you feel so free. You can see everything on a good day. You're untethered from the earth and the gravity that holds you down, and it's like magic. As long as everything works, right? And when it doesn't work, though, in an airplane, things can get crazy pretty fast. I told you a story once before on the podcast about a time that I had a really scary ride in a T-38 in the Air Force because the um, part of the plane called the yaw stabilizer broke, and this airplane was slipping around like it was on ice except we were in the air, and that was not fun. Uh, landing a Blackhawk on a highway in Iraq to pick up a blown-up guy was not fun. So there's some times when things are chaotic in the air that you can be pretty scared pretty fast, and sometimes if things aren't going right, you can crash the plane, and that can have disastrous consequences. And sometimes it's not always up to the skill of the pilot. Sometimes, of course, it could be weather or equipment failure or something else that happens that's out of your control. And you can end up in a really bad situation really fast. Sort of like life, huh? Sometimes in life we plan for things and then we run into situations where the plane is going down and we didn't know what happened. Remember that verse that we've been talking about lately, Proverbs 17, 27 and 28 in the Passion Translation says, Can you bridle your tongue? When your heart is under pressure, that's how you show that you are wise. An understanding heart keeps you cool, calm, and collected no matter what you're facing. And I've been telling you that that's one of the secrets of being infinitely happy, learning how to bridle 
not just your tongue, but learn how to bridle your brain, how to manage your mind when you're under pressure. And one thing that pilots do to try to mitigate some of the things that they can't control is to make sure that they do control everything that they can. To ma- and I'm not talking about being a control freak. I'm talking about checking things out. They, they go through a procedure called the pre-flight checklist, and they make sure that every variable is accounted for, that everything that could go wrong that could be fixed before they get into the air is taken care of. They make sure they have a proper flight plan, that they know where they intend to go before they launch off into the air that they have enough fuel, that they have everything lined up that they need so that they can get there safely, so that they get on course. And I want that for you too. I want you to fly the plane of your life so you get where you need to go, so that you stay on course and safe and that you're set free from so many of the things in life that can ground us or limit us or sometimes send us crashing down in a fireball of problems that we were never meant to face. I've learned a lot from the pilots in my life about how how they prepare for flights. And all the things they do to make sure that their passengers are safe. And today, we're going to take flight. We're going to take a lesson from the pilots so we can learn to pilot our own lives into the wild blue yonder. We want to fly where God intends for us to fly. We're taking a flying lesson today, my friends, so that we can leave behind our limits and be set free. And we are going to start today. Hey, are you ready to change your life? If the answer is yes, there's only one rule. You have to change your mind first. And my friend, there's a place where the neuroscience of how your mind works smashes together with faith and everything starts to make sense. That place is called self-brain surgery. You can learn it and it will help you become healthier, feel better, and be happier. And the good news is you can start today. Thanks, Lisa. Hey, so glad to have you listening today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I live in Nebraska in the United States of America with my incredible wife, Lisa, my father-in-law, Tata, and the super pups, Harvey and Lewis. I'm a neurosurgeon and an author, and I'm here to help you harness neuroscience, the power of your brain, faith, the power of your spirit, and good old common sense to help you lead a healthier, better, happier life. Listen, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind, and I'm here to help you learn the art of self-brain surgery to get it done if you like the show. Please subscribe so you never miss an episode and tell your friends about it. If you tell two or three friends this podcast was helpful to you, imagine how much good we can all do around the world together. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I'm here to help you change your mind so you can change your life. Let's get after it. All right. So lately we've been drilling into this idea of finding some techniques to operate on our own minds, about learning strategies to identify and attack things that have been holding us back in our lives. And it sometimes feels a little overwhelming. There's so many different places and things that we struggle with that we don't really know how to get started. And I've been telling you that when I was a kid, my dad used to say, how do you eat an elephant? And I would say, I don't know. And he would say, one bite at a time. One bite at a time. Well, today, the bite we're taking is how to perform a crucial part of any safe flight, including the flight of your life. We weren't intended to be grounded, mired in problems, stuck in a place in our lives. We were intended, Christ said, to be abundant, to be joyful, to have an abundant life free of chains and limits, to fly into the future that God has for us. And one of the crucial parts of that is something called a pre-flight checklist. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that to make sure we get there safely. Now, I remember when I was little, I'd go out with my dad or my mom, and we'd walk around the airplane before we ever got inside it. And mom and dad, and sometimes brother Walters, whoever I was flying with, would literally touch and feel every part of the plane. They would move the rudder and the ailerons and the elevators back and forth and make sure they were moving properly. They would look at the tires, kick the tires, make sure that they looked okay, make sure that the propeller looked right, that it hadn't taken any damage, that there wasn't a bird that had hit it, that nicked it, that the propeller would do its job and it was attached attached properly. They would check the pedo tube that measured wind speed and make sure it wasn't blocked or that there wasn't a bird that had built a nest up in the engine cowling. So they did all these things, and it seemed so boring and so meticulous, and I I would always think, gosh, can't we just get in the plane and fly? But even once we got in the plane, there was a lot more work to be done before you could take off. They checked the radios. They made sure they were on the right frequency, that they could communicate with the tower, that that they knew that somebody out there knew where they intended to go and what altitude they were going to fly at and what direction so that if we happened to have a problem or a crash, somebody would know where to look for us, right? That's called filing a flight plan when you do it a little more formally. And they would make sure that when they turned the stick, the control surfaces actually moved. When they pushed the 
rudder pedals and they, and they engaged the yoke that the surfaces the aileron the rudder the elevators all moved properly that the plane was actually going to do what they told it to do and i thought it was pretty boring i wanted to just get up there and get after it in fact my dad wouldn't let me get my pilot's license when i was a kid i really wanted to when i was about 15 i wanted to get my pilot's license and he said no and the reason he said no is my dad made his living as an insurance agent and he read uh, he read that doctors have the worst safety rating of just about any class of private pilots. And for that reason, their insurance premiums are much higher. And Dad said the reason that is is doctors tend to think they know everything. Imagine that, right? Imagine especially brain surgeons, right? You wouldn't imagine that we would be arrogant or think we knew everything, right? <laughs> but Dad said that doctors think they know everything. They skip checklists. They they skip some of the things that they because they think they're smart enough to to overcome the lack of preparation, and that leads sometimes, unfortunately, to doctors crashing their planes. And so he didn't want me to do that until I was a little older, a little more mature. He didn't want me to fly and then later sort of assume that I knew a lot. He wanted to make sure that if I actually did learn how to fly, that in the right context at the right time in my life when I was a little bit more mature and took it a little more seriously because kids have a little bit of a you know invincibility issue anyway. So he didn't want me to do that. He didn't want me to, me to be that kind of doctor pilot he said i read a story recently about a a woman who a kid actually who was a teenager who was taking her first solo flight and when she got up in the air one of the wheels fell off the airplane she had to land without a wheel now that sounds to me like a pre-flight checklist problem it sounds like somebody at some level didn't properly investigate and look at those wheels on that plane surely they could have seen a loose bolt or a some something, some visual clue that that thing was going to fall off the airplane when it took off. To me, that I don't, sounds to me like a pre-flight checklist problem. Like somebody didn't look at the thing that led to that failure. And I've said this to you before, but I love one of my favorite things is when the Bible tells us something two thousand years ago, and then two thousand years later we discover it with science, and we think we're really smart for having discovered it. So neuroscience is just now proving out a lot of the things that God told us a long time ago about how important our brains are to our lives. He told us a long time ago that if we manage our thought lives in healthy ways, if we control our thinking, if we manage our minds, that it'll improve everything about our physical lives. Let me read you some scriptures. Philippians 4, 6 in the NIV says this, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. So think about that for a second. He's telling you a secret something from neuroscience we didn't discover for thousands of years, that you can fix your thoughts on something. You can decide what you're going to think about. And you're going to therefore decide to think about better things than some of the automatic things that your brain chemistry gives you. You have the opportunity to manipulate your thought life. And so he gives you a checklist here of things that you should think about in exchange for some of the things that you naturally want to think about. Fix your thoughts on what's true, what's honorable, what's right and pure and lovely and admirable. If it's excellent, if it's worthy of praise, think about that stuff. So imagine if you had a pre-flight checklist, so to speak. If you thought about the day that you're getting ready to have, so it's Saturday morning here, and I have a a day full of things that Lisa and I are going to do. And what if I thought ahead and I imagined conversations I was going to have later today, and I imagined the situation that the people I'm going to converse with are in, and I prepared for having better thoughts in response to what they might say to me. What if I spent a little time with a checklist of, okay, if this happens or they say that or they're going through this, I'm going to respond by something admirable or worthy or noble or good or worthy of praise. If I put that checklist in place, would it come back to me later when I needed it? If my heart was under pressure and I'd prepared by putting that checklist in place, would that help me? I think so. Here's some more. Colossians 3.2, set your mind 
on things above, not things on the earth. Set your mind. Fix your thoughts, Paul said. Now he's saying, set your mind. Hebrews 12, 2 in the Passion Translation. We look away from the natural realm and fasten our gaze on Jesus. Another version says, we fix our eyes on Jesus. We fasten our gaze onto Jesus who birthed faith within us. He's the author and perfecter of our faith, another version says. He leads us forward into the perfection of faith. His example is this, because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his, he endured the agony of the cross and conquered its humiliation. So look at that. We fix our gaze on Jesus. We decide what we're going to think about where we're going to set our mind, set our hearts, fix our eyes. And then he says, Jesus focused his heart. He focused his mind. He fixed his mind. He did the same thing. In neuroscience now, we know that we can actually change the chemistry of what our brains are doing when we decide to think about different things. If I tell you to think about one thing and then tell you to think about another thing and you do it, I can watch on a functional MRI scan your brain chemistry and blood flow to different parts of your brain actually change in response to what you decide to think about. And when you think better thoughts, you make better chemicals, you make more dopamine, more serotonin, more oxytocin, you get better in terms of your brain chemistry when you fix, set, fasten, cast your mind Fix your mind, set your mind, intentionally set your heart on certain things. This can be a pre-flight checklist for you, my friend. The notion that you can decide what your mind is going to focus on is one of the most important aspects of the human brain, and it's the key to becoming infinitely happier and funnily, funnily, is that a word? It's funny to me (laughs) that science is just now getting around to figuring out this stuff. It's amazing. 2,000 years later, the Bible's been telling us, fix your mind, think different thoughts, cast your gaze, set your intention. And now science is saying, you know what? When you do that stuff, your brain chemistry gets better. Amazing. There's a neuropsychologist, a really good writer named Dr. Carolyn Leaf. In fact, you should follow her on Instagram. I'll put the links. She's always posting really positive things. Um, She writes about what she calls the MPA, the Multiple Perspective Analysis. So check out what she says. Self-regulation using what I call the multiple perspective advantage, multiple perspective analysis, is the deliberate and intentional process of standing outside yourself and observing your thoughts, words, and actions and changing them. The ability to do this is unique to humans. Remember a couple weeks ago I read you from John Piper. He was saying the exact same thing in different words, this idea that humans have the ability to think about our thinking. Humans have the ability to pull out a thought before we react to it. And if we're disciplined enough, spin it around, look at it under the microscope. I've told, I've called it before the thought biopsy. Like before you decide that a thought is true, that it's worthy, it's it's acceptable to accept as a label for yourself or a truth about yourself or that you need to respond to it or that you need to react to it. Before you decide those things, you need to study The thought, biopsy it, look at it under the microscope, spin it around, use that multiple perspective analysis, use that ability that humans have to think about our thinking. Again, Scripture got there first. Check out 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So Paul is saying in that Scripture, we can grab a thought and we can say, no, I'm not going to accept this thought. I'm going to replace it with that one. I'm going to make my thoughts come under my own submission and I'm not going to be slaves to them. I'm going to control them. This is your pre-flight checklist, friend. If you are flying the plane of your own life and you just run out there and jump in the plane and flip on the switch and take off, there are going to be times when you crash or you get lost or you run out of gas because you didn't take the time to set your mind, to think about where you were going that day, who you were going to be meeting with, who you were going to be interacting with. Remember Proverbs 17, 27? I read it earlier in the Passion uh, Passion Translation. Can you bridle your tongue when your heart is under pressure? That's how you show that you're wise. An understanding heart keeps you cool, calm, and collected no matter what you're facing. A good pilot, when they get in trouble, they stay calm. A good surgeon, when we have trouble in the operating room, we stay calm. And we stay calm because we have rehearsed and practiced and studied for everything that can happen essentially, or at least a strategy for what to do when something new and unexpected happens. We're ready for that. Pilots practice 
stalls. They fly the plane into unsafe um, positions so that the controls will fail and they have to recover the aircraft, they call it, to, to fix the problem so they don't crash. They practice that stuff so that if it happens in a real flight or when they don't expect it, they'll know how to handle it. That's why that guy was able, Sully, was able to land that plane in the Hudson River. He knew how to do that because they had practiced those kinds of emergency scenarios. They've simulated them before. And so one of the secrets to becoming infinitely happier is to expect the pressure. If it says, can you bridle your tongue when your heart's under pressure? Well, the way that you get to be able to bridle your tongue is you anticipate the pressure. You think ahead and you say, what if this happens? What if the person says that to me? What if I get caught off guard and I feel my emotions rising? What am I going to do then? If you've thought about it, if you've prepared for it, if you had a pre-flight checklist that you went through and you filled your brain and your heart and your mind with all these alternative ways that you can react, then when the thing stalls, you know how to get out of it. Remember what Chris Voss said about when the pressure's on, you don't rise to the occasion. You fall to your highest level of preparation. Well, pilots have practiced things that might happen thousands of times. Surgeons, we prepare for things, and we train for things. And when you're training, sometimes the professor will let something bleed and make you stop it. So you learn how, in a controlled way, where somebody's there to help you be safe, you learn how to fix a problem that you're facing so that when you face it in an unexpected time, you're ready. So that idea of bridling your tongue, bridling your heart, bridling your brain when your heart's under pressure, the way you get that done is to anticipate the pressure. I try to put about two seconds in my heart, in in my life, I try to put about two seconds between stimulus and response in conversations. If you're having a normal conversation with me and you say something and we're having some sort of a elevation of our conversation or if we're in a business meeting or a board meeting and things are getting a little bit um, emotional, you will probably never hear me say something like, how dare you? Or now hold on a second. You, you'll almost never hear me say that because I put a couple of seconds in between what you say and what I reply. And sometimes it feels like I'm not going to say something, but it's because in my brain I'm processing and I'm trying to figure out what the best path forward for this conversation is. Why? Because if I feel myself getting emotional or if I feel the situation is getting tense or the, the conversation is getting stressful, one of the one of the surest ways to make sure that nothing good is going to come out of it is if you let the emotion rise. If you let the situation get become more emotional and less rational, you will almost never get to the place where you need to get in your conversation or in your meeting or in your deal. So I try to take a couple of seconds and just process, biopsy the thought, spin it around, think about the outcome of what I'm about to say, and try to help the situation get back on course. I try to steer it back into the calmer air of reason and out of that turbulent, dangerous air of emotion. And that's because one of my pre-flight checkpoints is that I try to anticipate what I'm going to face in a particular day. Like if it's a if it's a business day and I know I've got a certain set of meetings and I'm going to or have patients in the office or I'm doing surgery or whatever, I'm going to think through the people I'm likely to be around. I try to if I know I'll try to think, what are they going through? What are they facing right now? What are their emotional states likely to be? And what are their triggers and drivers of those things going to be? And I try to plan and and anticipate situations that I might get myself into that could have certain kinds of outcomes so that I'm a little bit ahead of the game in terms of being ready. You know, pilots look at radar and they know about weather reports and they make sure that they have thought through what they're likely to encounter during that trip so that they don't get into a situation they can't take care of. And you can do that too with this pre-flight checklist, this idea of setting your mind, fixing your eyes, guarding your heart, anticipating, planning, carefully thinking about every thought and taking it captive and making sure that you're going to be able to get that airplane of your life through the flight safely. Look, this is self-brain surgery, friend. It's biblical. It's consistent with neuroscience. The idea is if you're going to fly your life into the the promised land that God intends for you, that remember Jeremiah 29, 11, when he says, I have the plan. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. God doesn't want you to crash the plane of your life into the mountain because you 
didn't learn how to have a conversation. You didn't anticipate something that might come along. And, and when it did come along, it wrecked you. We've talked a lot about how the circumstances of our lives can wreck us or they can give us great opportunity. In the last episode with Kristen Smedley, her two sons were born blind. And she had to see that as an opportunity for them instead of a handicap. She had to realize that from their perspective, they were just living their life. And she had to mend her perception in order to fit the reality of the circumstance. And then she could find joy and hope and faith again. And that's what we have to do. And the pre-flight checklist will help you. Walk around the airplane of your day. Walk around and look at this, the things that you might have trouble with and try to anticipate them. Make a good flight plan for your day. Think through. Set your mind on certain things. Filter your life through that checklist from Philippians 4 and think about better things. Replace the hard thoughts, the bad thoughts with better ones. Biopsy the dangerous ones and get rid of them. Use your multiple perspective analysis advantage and use your pre-flight checklist and start today. Hey, thanks for listening. Please subscribe to the show so you automatically get every episode. And if you like the show, you'll love my weekly letter. Check out my writing at drleewarren.substack.com, drleewarren.substack.com. Get the free newsletter every week for my best prescriptions for becoming healthier, feeling better, and being happier through the power of faith and neuroscience smashing together via self-brain surgery, drleewarren.substack.com. And if you need prayer, go to the prayer wall at wleewarrenmd.com slash prayer. The theme music for the show is Make Us One by Tommy Walker, graciously provided for free by the great folks over at tommywalkerministries.org. Check it out and consider supporting them, tommywalkerministries.org. Remember, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And the good news is you can start today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. I'll talk to you soon. God bless you, friend. Have a great day.
know what we're talking about. So I need you to sing this little part with me. Say, get up, get up, get up. You can get up. Rise up, rise up, 